The Great War in Review. Uh, the, uh, the Great War is a game published by the Plastic Soldier Company and designed by Richard Borg. Now, the Plastic Soldier Company is a company that produces a range of uh, miniatures in uh, 15 millimeter, 28 millimeter, uh, 172 scale miniatures and model kits, as well as uh, rule sets for those uh, model kits and miniatures in addition to board games. And this would be one of the board games. Now, uh, Richard Borg, uh, most famous for his design of the Command and Colors system. Uh, the Command and Colors system has been around for about 20 years or so, and there are numerous games that have been published by numerous pub publishers on uh, different uh, eras in, in human conflict. You've got uh, Avalon Hill did uh, Battle Cry, again with plastic soldiers, um, and that was uh, back, well, I guess around close to 2000. You have uh, Memoir 44 by Days of Wonder, which is a World War II. Uh, Command and Colors game GMT put out the block version of the uh, Command and Colors games. They're very popular uh, with ancients, medieval, uh, Napoleonics, that sort of thing. Uh, you also have Fantasy in uh, Battle Lore, which was originally uh, uh, published by Days of Wonder and most recently by Fantasy Flight. Fantasy Flight also did a uh, Westeros themed, being a Game of Thrones themed. Command and Colors, so it, the system has a lot of legs. Having played Memoir 44, I just, you know, and with all the games that were constantly coming out, it didn't grab my attention right away. I said, okay, you know, I, I haven't really cared for many of the board game implementations of, uh, in, in set in World War One, so I passed on it initially. But then when there was a Kickstarter that was uh, announced, and I guess that was uh, right up at the tail end of 2017, um, for a, a French army expansion and uh, some other expansions with uh, specialist soldiers and whatnot, I decided, you know, to read a little bit more on it and saw how the reviews looked and and thought, okay, I, I, I will do this, and I'm glad that I did. So, uh, World, uh, the Great War, by Plastic Soldier Company, designed by Richard Borg. So, victory in uh, in the game is achieved by. Um, earning victory tokens. Now these uh, victory tokens are achieved by eliminating enemy units and also by achieving certain objectives. And in this game, those objectives are primarily taking and holding uh, trench lines, enemy trench lines. So, and those trench lines typically will be on your opponent's side of the map. So sitting back on, on, on your side of the map and just hoping to shoot your opponent to victory, unless you're, def you're the defender, is not going to work. So. It encourages the attacker to get out, push up the map, and uh, and try to force their way into the opponent's trench line, which is very thematic to World War One. So the design itself, it's it's not difficult, yet it has a good amount of strategic and tactical uh, depth. So components-wise, you have one map board. Now it's double-sided. On the one side, you have your pristine sort of open field, indicative of uh, of France or Belgium at the time. And on the other side, you have the more blasted, muddy, um, typical uh, of, of no man's land that's been fought over for any period of time. Uh, there are, uh, these maps are used and they're changed for each scenario based on these terrain overlays that come with the game. Now, there are a lot that come with the game. Uh, you have terrain overlays for forest, for, for villages, for hills, uh, for mine craters, but most importantly, trenches. You have a shit ton of trench terrain overlays and finding the right one that you need for the scenario can be a little bit of a pain in the neck because they're double-sided and quite often you're looking for that specific uh, T branch that you know, or the, the trench that branches down to the right or to the left and uh, you know I haven't been bothered to take the time to separate those into a different bag and I probably should to make setup a little bit easier because setup is the one part of the game that takes some time it's a little bit fiddly but the game itself can play in about an hour or so once you do have it set up you can choose to play the same scenario again just by switching sides which is always very interesting to see what tactical decisions and choices you know your opponent had to make you know if you feel that you were wrong somehow i haven't run into that yet with this game but but typically you can play two or three uh depending how much time you know battles in a night or in an afternoon so i, I like that part of the game uh, there's just that initial fiddliness with the terrain overlays. But anyways, you have the map, you've got the terrain overlays, counters for what you need, and you have your two armies uh, in the base game for the Germans and for the British. And uh, typically you will have uh, three types of units uh, that you'll be using. You'll have your regular infantry that are represented by four infantrymen. You have your machine gun teams and your mortar teams. And the machine gun and mortar teams are represented also by four miniatures 
just in different poses, but that's the combat strength of the unit. Once any of the units is, is completely eliminated, that scores you one victory medal for the game. So you're going to get most of your victory medals by eliminating enemy units. You know, and usually about four of them I've, I've come to see, and that's how you're going to win the game in addition to uh, you know, taking over enemy trenches. And for the defender, you can score points when, uh, when certain command cards come up. You can score points if, if uh, your opponent is not if the attacker is not, you know, taking those trenches from you. But we can get into the command cards in a second. So I, as with, uh, you also get these two decks of cards that come with the game. And that would be the command deck and the combat deck. Now, most command and color games that, that I'm familiar with just have the command deck. And that has section cards and tactics cards in there. They're mixed in. And the scenario will tell you how many command cards you're going to start with, how many combat cards you would start with, what your artillery strength is, uh, how many uh, HQ tokens you have and how many victory points and what your starting units and their positions are in addition to the map setup. Um, the fourth kind of unit in the game that you have, well, there's, there's let's say, five. There, there's the artillery, which is off-board and it's represented by a cardboard token. Uh, now, this has a number printed on it. There's two of them for each side. Uh, and you'll, you will have one to start the game with, and that just tells you what your combat strength is for your off-board artillery. It range from three, four, five, or six, and that tells you how many dice you're going to be throwing uh, when you're using your artillery to combat. Now, you also have the specialist in the base game. There's the specialist bomber represented. Specialists have square bases, and this is sort of a unit that augments your infantry unit. It doesn't count towards another casualty. The unit strength is still four. But this bomber will allow for different abilities. Uh, for example, when you are adjacent and initiating close combat, any unit that you're adjacent to another one, you would roll typically three dice, but the bomber will allow you to roll four. Um, or if you're two hexes away and you're using ranged combat, um, a different result uh, on, on your die rolls will also uh, allow you to, to uh, eliminate an enemy unit, and that's the deadly die, the skull. And I'll get to the to the dice res results and the symbols in a second. But you have these specialist units, and in the base game you have one, you have the uh, the bomber. So typically once you, you've set up your scenario, you have your starting units, everything is, is, is more or less ready to go. Um, gameplay starts up, and based on the number of cards you have in your hand, typically it's about five of your command cards. Those will be made up of section cards and tactics cards, and that'll be what is going to allow you to, 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 uh, to operate. You're ordering units based on the command cards. So you can, based on, on what you have, you can have uh, either move two, order two units to the, to the right section. And as with all the command and uh, colors games, the map board is divided into three sections. It's uh, divided into the left, center, and right section and your command cards are going to tell you um, you know what your options are in terms of ordering units so sometimes you can order units in all sections sometimes you can only order units in the center section sometimes it's just one unit that you can order sometimes it's it's three um, and it's going to be spread out that way and the tactics cards will allow you to kind of operate outside of those constraints of this of the section cards and sometimes it will tell you uh, battlefield units only and those are for your plastic soldiers because if you have a section card that says you know uh, you you can you can attack on on the right with three units you can order two units and use one of those orders for your offboard artillery so unless the card says battlefield units your offboard artillery can be ordered as well so on your turn you're going to take one of those cards and then you can also use this second deck of combat cards now these are, are outlined in red and these are very flavorful cards um, that, that are that very specific to the certain situations, whether that be uh, for trench raids, trench foot, lice, um, this sort of thing that, that, that can come up uh, in, in over the course of a battle that are, you know, either acts of God, uh, you know, special orders from HQ, different abilities or whatnot. And they're paid for with a currency and that currency in the game are these HQ tokens. And now these HQ tokens, you have a starting amount. Um, you can also turn in, uh, or rather, uh, at the end of your turn, instead of drawing a new combat card to fill up your hand, let's say if you had three for the scenario and you're, you've used one, you have two, instead of drawing one up, you can choose to take two HQ tokens instead if you're running low. Uh, or if you didn't play any combat cards and you have no HQ tokens, you can discard one 
for a HQ token. And then at that point, draw up a new card or take two more HQ tokens. So uh, you have options to make up that currency in addition to one of the die results on the symbols uh, being a HQ token. So that would reward you uh, over the course of the game for initiating battle if you don't have any combat results uh, eliminating or routing enemy units you, you're still rewarded you can be by getting these HQ tokens and that, that again is very thematic in the first world war uh, because uh, all the way up the command chain uh, it was typically advised to attack 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 even in the face of grim results of victory it was uh, it was initiative was placed on and, and rewards were given to commanders that were bold in attacking uh, whether that be through night trench raids or, or daily raids and whatnot um, so that I find that to be a, a very thematic um, addition to the command and color system on, on the direct results so what you'll do is you'll order your units and then once your units are ordered they can either move they can battle or they can do both uh, typically an infantry unit can move one in battle or it can move two and not battle your heavy weapon teams can can either move or battle so if they choose to move they, they would not have the requisite amount of time to set up their their heavy weapons again to get off a shot um, but you're going to want to move those heavy weapon teams early on because they're, they're typically ineffective uh, at range where they're where they're set up initially and sometimes it, once you've realized that uh, that that is the case it's too late um, so you might want to start considering moving those early if you see that they need to get into into more effective range move them early on that's just a little pro tip here in the middle of this review but anyways so you're going to order your units that they're going to move then they're going to battle and then you would have your your cleanup phase at the end where you draw back up your command cards draw back up your your combat cards and and that's that's generally it and then play would pass to your opponent's turn and then rinse repeat do the same thing right so so the variation comes in the card play and and of course the die results so uh getting into that so battling right so if you if you've decided you're going to move then you're going to battle uh you're going to have a, a number on of uh, of dice that are rolled based on the range that you are from your opponent um, long range you're going to throw one die the closer you get you're going to have more dice that you can throw like now there as with all the command and colors uh, games the the dice have symbols on them and each one of these symbols will achieve a different battlefield result and some of these can be augmented or negated depending on on terrain features that your your target is in so for example you have the burst symbol the burst the burst is going to cause a casualty on on the enemy unit you're firing on and you remove a figurine um that's going to always happen unless there there you know are some some game effects uh on cards or whatnot but 99 percent of the time burst is going to cause casualties then you have the soldier symbol the soldier symbol will do the same as a burst it will cause a casualty to your your target uh unit whereby they would have to eliminate an enemy soldier unless they are in a terrain where that terrain provides some sort of uh, of cover and 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 for example you would have uh the trench lines right now there are a lot of trenches they're scattered all over the the boards uh, on most of the scenarios um it's a prevalent terrain uh, piece and um trenches if you look at the at the uh, at the stats for the for the trenches what they do is they will remove two soldier results if you're at range and if you're at close combat one soldier so so again uh you you can still fire at range you know at, at two hexes away but you you're going to have two soldier results negated um from whatever you're rolling and normal infantry units are only going to be rolling two dice at that range anyway so you're going to want to get up close get into that close combat where you're 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 firing with three three dice and and that way you're only having one soldier result negated now another one of the die results is the flag the flag causes the target unit to retreat out of the hex that they're in again this is very good to push your enemy units out of of the trenches now if, if you look the the trenches what they will do at range is they will uh, negate or ignore two flag results and at close combat they will ignore one so again really rewarding you to get up close and get into close combat uh, you also have the deadly die symbol and that would be the skull now what the skull does 
is, is, is that's normally ignored unless you have a bomber unit. Uh, whereas the, the, the bomber, the bonus that the bomber unit would give you is that you can roll an extra die in close combat. So you're rolling four dice. Or if you're at range, the deadly die counts almost like a burst symbol. It can't be negated by anything. It causes a casualty. So again, there's, there's, a, there's a benefit to tossing grenades from two hexes away. The deadly die is also important in artillery. Now, as I mentioned, you can use your orders to order artillery to attack. Now, how that's done is you take this artillery overlay, you place it on a target hex, and then depending on how many dice you have in your artillery reserves, you would roll that many dice and then place them in the hexes around, or if there's no room, you can, you can just, you know, point out that they're there. But any dice would would be placed in the hexes as numbered. Now, if you have any doubles, doubles also score a hit on the target hex. Uh, so if you have um, two sets of doubles, let's say you're rolling four dice and you have two sets of doubles, there are two hexes that are going to take two dice worth of attacks and also four dice would go into the target hex. Again, this is very thematic with World War I. Artillery was king and uh, it, it, it would often fall all over the place. It would fall short, it would fall far. Um, you know, range finding was a science and they did whatever they could to, to, to try and improve this throughout the war. A number of innovations were made in artillery throughout the First World War. Um, so again, it's, it's very good and the deadly die will cause a casualty uh, on any of those target hexes as well. So um, artillery, very effective and also before you start the scenario, most scenarios will have an opening bombardment, which is typical also in terms of World War I battles. Sometimes the opening bombardment would last for a number of hours for a quick one, usually a whole day, sometimes a whole week uh, in the case of the Somme. It was close to a week, if not uh, a full seven days. I think it was six, six days. Um, but anyways, what you do is a very simple mechanic is that you roll from left to right or from right to left, depending on how you want. Um, for the, uh, you just roll a die for the three uh, lines of, of hexes in the middle of the board and you just count along and wherever that number lands, if there's wire there, usually there's wire strewn about depending on how the scenario starts, you flip the wire over to shell holes. And then you just keep counting, you roll from that hex and you count over that many spots and you put shells as there as well. If there's no wire, you just put a shell hole. And, and again, this is very good for the attacker because you're going to want to use those shell holes as cover. Uh, there's very little cover on an open field and you're sitting duck. Um, any kind of gunfire into, into open hexes can be effective because of the soldiers and the retreating, the flags to retreat. So quite often you'll take casualties or you're forced to run back as you run in the open. But if you have those shell craters, you can hop between those and use them for cover to get up close enough uh, to the enemy trenches, trenches and try to root them out with close combat. And that's generally how the, how the game flows and it's very good that way. And this opening bombardment adds more variability in terms of the gameplay because it'll never be the same twice. Even if you play the same scenario and you're switching to play different sides, you can get completely different uh, die results. So if you're not into luck, you know, uh, you, you may want to look sideways on this game. Uh, there's a lot of die rolling, there's a lot of card play. Uh, things will never be the same twice. Um, but I personally like it and I think it's thematically very good. So once you're done with your with moving your ordered units, battling with your ordered units, you have that cleanup phase where you draw back up to your, your command cards and your combat cards or and or take HQ tokens, play turns around, and then you just rinse repeat until you wind up with a player reaching the requisite number of victory medals to win the game. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the attacker is rewarded by moving forward and taking enemy trenches, there are usually a, a permanent victory medal or a temporary victory medal that is awarded by, by taking enemy trenches. And those are the ones that are going to push you over the top to win the game. A lot, I, I've played it many times and there have been plenty of interesting situations where I've been hanging onto a trench line as the attacker, having pushed the enemy out of, of the trench line, needing just two victory medals to win the game, getting one temporary for holding that trench now, but not getting the, the one for killing the unit that I just pushed out. There's maybe one soldier left in there. Then on, on my opponent's turn, that one soldier is able to push me out of the trench. I have to give that temporary medal back to the pool. And then they, the, my, my opponent was able to, to, to maybe eliminate my unit, which has now been pushed back out in the open. And then he, he won the game, right? So 
Uh, there's this tug of war, this push and pull, and along with the combat cards that add a lot of variability to the game, really interesting, and, and not having the right HQ tokens to get access to that gas attack or that much needed bonus to your attack. I found it was very thematic, uh, you know, to the, the, the broken lines of communication that were so prevalent throughout the First World War and just all around added a, a lot of uh, thematic uh, narrative to the game and made it very interesting. I found that the, the, the tactical play, the push and pull back and forth was a lot of fun in terms of uh, of evoking that, that narrative and the difficulties that were present um, you know, on those those hellish battlefields of the First World War. And, and, you know, I always have a hard time, you know, trying to game something like, you know, with, with war. But, but you know, it, this is a beer and pretzels war game. It's, it's, it's not difficult to pick up, uh, but it has enough tacti tactical depth to it to make it interesting and fun. And like I said, you can play it two, three times uh, in a sitting uh, easily once you have it set up. So... Um, there are a number of expansions for it with this Kickstarter that came out, the last one for the French expansion. There was also a number of, of specialist units, uh, soldiers, the square base soldiers that you can add and augment your regular infantry with. There was a chart to indicate uh, sort of backwards compatibility. Go back to the original scenarios in the base game, and I've been playing a lot of them like that, where you can add specialists, a number of them, to your infantry as you see fit. Uh, so you'll have officers, you'll have spotters, you'll have machine gunners, uh, that sort of thing. And, and they add a lot more depth and flavor to the game uh, because, you know, machine gunners, uh, you know, the Lewis machine gun and whatnot, uh, the, these, you know, handheld machine guns were starting to, assault machine guns were, were, were being produced and, and, and worked into the strategy for trench raiding. And, and, I, and I felt that there was a very keen eye to that by the, by the designer and, and the design that went into the game. And they play well. There's a tank expansion. Again, tanks were a late addition to, to the war in the First World War. And there are a lot of scenarios uh, that were produced for the tanks. I haven't tried any of them yet, but the models are, are really nice. Um, the models in general, I find them to be really good. And, and the Plastic Soldier Company being a model and miniatures company, they also have all of these for, for sale on their website. So I, I've lost a couple of, of German uh, loaders uh, for the machine gun teams. Uh, because of uh, you know pets and uh, I was I was surprised to see that you could just buy the bag of soldiers on their website So again that that's uh, an added bonus. So a lot of really interesting stuff in the expansions There's talk of either a US or, or Russian expansion coming down the pipes So I'm interested to see where that goes personally I would like to see more on the Austro-Hungarian side where things were a little bit more open for longer at first and just to have more um, more combatants on the uh, on the uh, the great powers uh, side, if you will, um, but uh, but if, if U.S. expansion comes to that, that's great. There, were, there were, you know, there were a lot of interesting uh, battles that took place uh, from that point of the war on as well, right? So either way, I'm sure that that the designers will do a good job, and 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 the publishers as well with with the components, and they'll probably add more interesting uh, and uh, uh, developments to the to the strategy, and uh, and I look forward to that. So there you have it. Uh, the Great War, I think a very worthy and fine entry into the Command and Color system. I love the presentation. I think it's a, a very good uh, adaptation uh, of the system and a very uh, accurate um, representation of World War I tactics, both on the ground and with artillery and everything. There are no planes in the game. Who knows? Maybe that'll, that'll come next. But I think that should be more of an off-board thing, much like the artillery. But it can be done. So there you have it, The Great War in review. Uh, I'll give it a couple of thumbs up and thank you for watching.